and um, yeah, Andy's going to lead us in the prayers first thing, and then uh, we've got John uh, going to speak to us later from, from our readings. Um, so, oh, does anybody, would anybody like to read? We haven't got uh, Lisa with us today. Oh, Joy's going to read. Brilliant. Thanks, Excellent. Joy. Got it sorted. Great. So, um, I'll hand over to Andy. Good morning, everyone. Let's uh, bow our heads in prayer to begin. Gracious God, we praise you and thank you that you welcome us into your presence. Speak to us today and teach us through the example of your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we'll begin by with two songs of worship this morning. Blessed be your name, followed by Do You Not Know, Have You Not Heard? Let's join together in song. He gave 
gives power to the faint and the weak. His hand takes all of those who fall and those who wait for God will gain new strength. They shall rise on wings and those who wait for God will gain new strength. They Let's bow our heads for the confession part of our service this morning. If you know these words, you can say them with me, uh, or you may just want to echo them silently in your heart. And we say together, Almighty and merciful God, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all our heart. We have not loved others as Christ loved us. We are truly sorry. In your mercy, forgive us, help us to amend our lives, and the delight in your will, and walk in your ways, to the glory and praise of your name. Amen. May God our Father, who by our Lord Jesus Christ has reconciled the world to himself, and the forgiveness of sins of all who truly repent, Pardon and deliver us from all our sins and grant us the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we'll hand over to Joy and John for the reading and the talk. Thanks, John. Okay. Good morning, all. Good John. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Right, uh, Joy's got the reading this morning, and uh, that's from Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 to the end of the chapter. So Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 to the end of the chapter. Some very well, a very well-known story that uh, I'm sure uh, you'll be familiar with. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the, dry, the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. 
And the people of Israel went into the middle of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the middle of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the middle of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel <coughs> saw the great power that the Lord, had, the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that, Joy. Um, I'd also like to just, before we start, thank uh, Dave and Trish for organising the uh, prayer day yesterday uh, and I'm sure for all those who were able to participate at any point during the day they would have found it a really uh, a most encouraging and blessed time so again thank you for organizing that as I said these uh, verses this story is a very well-known story to all of you I'm sure um, there's a story that goes uh, it's based in America uh, uh, of a visiting speaker coming to a church and he was speaking on this very passage and as he was talking about the children of Israel walking through the, de uh, the Red Sea a voice came up from the crowd saying praise the Lord what a mighty miracle he saved those children by allowing them to walk through the ocean on dry land now, the visiting speaker didn't really much believe in miracles, so he thought he wanted to intervene. So he intervened and he said, listen, that probably wasn't the Red Sea they walked through. It was probably the Reed Sea, which was like a boggy marshland. And the tide was probably ebbing and going out. And so actually, the children of Israel probably just walked through about six inches of water, you know, shallow water, and they walked across the sea. At that point, the same voice shouted out, praise the Lord, what a miracle. He drowned all, all those Egyptians in six inches of water. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know about you. I tend to take it literal. If this is what the Bible is saying, I think that's what happened. I don't think we need to try and interpret it. I think we can accept it for what it is. It's an amazing miracle of deliverance where God was leading his people out of slavery into the promised land, into freedom. And uh, it's just an amazing intervention of God. But in a sense, I don't want to look at these verses directly. I want to look at the verses leading up to it because we look at this and we have to appreciate the real, um, the real uh, sense of magnitude of what's happening here is if we read in verse uh, 1, it says, uh, verse 2, 
of chapter 14, it actually says that the Lord spoke to Moses and told Israel to turn back and camp at this precise spot by the Red Sea. It goes on to say in verse four that God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so he will change his mind and he will come back to try and uh, capture you and take you back into slavery. Now you imagine the Egyptian, uh, sorry, the Israelites were now at that point where they were camped with the Red Sea in front of them and the armies of Egypt coming up behind them. They were in a dreadful place. It was awful. But God had set up this situation. Why? Because he says, I will make, sorry, I will let the Egyptians know that I am Lord. I will make a reputation for myself, for my own name. So this was God working to demonstrate that he is God to his people, but also to the Egyptians, to those around him, uh, around the nation, sorry. Now, what we have here is that actually as the army was coming up, because we might think, oh, this is a wonderful miracle. It would have been wonderful to be there and, and to be part of that. Fantastic. But actually we're told, again, if we look further down in verse uh, 10, as the, uh, the Israelites saw the Egyptians coming, they were terrified. They're thinking, hang on, wh why have you, Moses, brought us to this point? We can't go forward. There's a sea in front of us. We can't go back. There's an army pursuing us. Why didn't you just leave us in Egypt? At least we had food and homes there. The fact they were slaves and being abused had gone out of their heads at this point because they saw a clear and present danger. But God said this, and this is, I think, something that we need to hold on to, each one of us in our life. Uh, in verse 13, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Now, this phrase often comes out uh, to God's people when God is about to do an act, a mighty act. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Stand firm. You will see the deliverance the Lord will bring today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Now, isn't that amazing? God is saying, I am in control. I am in control. I will bring your deliverance. And I am in control. I will defeat the Egyptians. I will fight for you. And he says, one condition. Just be still. Just be still. Let me do this. So I think that's a, it's an amazing account, really, when we consider this. And God did it, didn't he? He did it marvelously. But in a sense, I believe this is a picture of our salvation. And in fact, Paul uses this as an illustration. He talks about, as the people went through the Red Sea, they were baptized into Moses. And actually, it's a picture of, of our salvation as well. You see, before we encountered Jesus Christ, his death on the cross and his resurrection, we were slaves to sin. That's how the Bible describes our position. We were slaves to sin. And as a result of that, we were condemned. As a result of that, we were dead to God. As a result of that, we faced eternal damnation. It's a terrible position to be in. But as we are baptized into Christ, his death and his resurrection, through faith, we find that we are now made alive with Christ. We are free from sin. We have eternal life. We have a future. We have a hope. And that's a wonderful position to be in. It's not something we can do. It's all of God. Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. The Holy Spirit breathes life into us and he makes the covenant establishing the death of Christ valid and effective for us. 
Isn't that a wonderful position? We couldn't do anything. We just had to be still and receive the grace of God. And that's a wonderful position. He will fight for us. It's a lovely verse in uh, uh, Romans chapter 8. It says, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? We know he has promised he will accomplish what he started in our life. And that's our eternal salvation. It's guaranteed. God has established that. That's the confidence we can have. And listen, there are times when we face hardship and we think, is it all worth it? Shall I just go back to what I was doing before? Shall I just live my own way and be in control of my own life? That, that in a sense, is what the Israelites faced, wasn't it? When they saw the Egyptians coming, they said, oh, surely it was better we went back to our old way of life. We wouldn't be in this predicament. But God had something better for them. And God has something better for us too. If God is for us, who can be against us? You know, uh, I also just very mindful of a verse. It's a verse that I've um, has captured my thinking for many years. And I keep coming back to it. I keep trying to think about it. I keep reading about it. I keep listening to sermons about it, trying to get the depth of its meaning. And again, this is found in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 37. Uh, it talks about, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, in a sense, I, I, I just want to pick that up for a moment in a personal sense, because I'm very aware that even as Christians, we sometimes go through some very, very tough challenging times sometimes we face bereavement and we feel devastated sometimes we face ill health and, and we just feel devastated why can't you deliver me from this god and there are situations in life where we just feel overpowered we feel afraid like the israelites facing the red sea and the egyptians we're afraid and it's a horrible position to be in but the reality is this, we are more than conquerors. But what does that really mean? Now, there are two thoughts on this. The first thought is that the victory is not just, a, you know, we just scrape over the line to become victors. It's not like scoring that last minute try to win a match. It, it's the fact that it's an overwhelming victory. It's a huge victory. Because Jesus Christ has won it. He has defeated death itself. And if he has defeated death and we are baptized into Christ, we have defeated death in Christ Jesus. Now that still means we have to face trouble and hardship. But I think there's another way of looking at it, which I think is far richer in another sense. Now if you think about two warring armies, and they're in a, a, a battle, and they're conflicting each other, and there's um, damage to uh, property and infrastructure and industry, there's loss of uh, lives, there's funding. One of those armies will come out as victorious. But in a sense, both armies have lost. They're in deficit, aren't they? They've lost lives, they've lost property, they've lost prosperity. So one may have won the war, but in a sense, they're in deficit. But for the Christian, the victory, we are more than conquerors because actually we have gained in victory. We have gained. We don't lose out. We have gained. We've gained life. We've gained acceptance with Christ, with God. We've gained a future. We've gained an inheritance. We've gained life eternal. And so actually through whatever we face, though we feel that we're facing hardship, we, in obedience we bring glory to God. And in fact, we gain. It's, it's, it's like Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He understood that. 
that the, and Paul should know he went through trouble, didn't he? He was beaten, he was imprisoned, he, he, he was near to death, he was shipwrecked. And yet through all of this, he could say, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I am more than a victor in Christ Jesus. And I'm very aware that, you know, for some people right now, they may be going through a very challenging time. But I want you to know that whatever you're facing, again, Paul says, these troubles are momentary. But ahead of us lies a rich reward, great gain in Christ Jesus. And that is heaven, eternal life with God. That starts now, yes, but it goes on forever. My final point is this, and it picks up on what David was saying last week, actually. And uh, if we read Exodus chapter 15, after the children have gone through the Red Sea, almost that whole chapter is devoted to a song of praise and thanksgiving. You know, as we go through life, we'll fa face hardships, we'll face victories. But I think it's right, it's incumbent on us to praise God with our voices. As we've done this morning, it's good, it's right. It reminds us of what God has done for us to, to win our salvation, to gain our salvation, to redeem us and make us his own. You know, in, I think, is it uh, Malachi? It talks about we are his treasure. Isn't that a wonderful way? God looks at us as his treasure, paid with great price, his very own life. But he picked it up again in his resurrection that we too may have life. So I hope this has been an encouragement to you. I hope it will bless you. I hope if nothing else remains with you, you will understand that we are more than conquerors. Though we may feel now broken, Though we may feel now sad, though we may feel now challenged and under pressure, we are more than conquerors in Christ because we are not in deficit. We're never in deficit. We only gain in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless us. Can I just pray before we uh, finish or whatever? Uh, I think we have some more songs. I'm not sure, but let's pray. Almighty God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you it's uh, relevant now as it always has been. We thank you for these encouragements, these truths that we can hold on to, that you will sustain us, you will deliver us. Lord, and ultimately you will deliver us from sin. You have delivered us from sin. May we walk worthy of this calling, fill our hearts with a new song, and Lord, even though that we find ourselves at times being hard pressed, even crushed, we thank you that you are victorious and in you we have victory as well. May our hearts and our minds just sing your praises. Be glorified in us today, Lord, for your glory. We praise you. Amen. 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 Um, so let's stay prayerful as uh, we continue with our intercessions. Uh, so in the knowledge of all that God has done for us, let us bring him our concerns for the church and for the world. And when I say, Lord, in your mercy, you're welcome to respond, hear our prayer. So we pray, thank you, Father, for your love, which forgives again and again. And thank you that you're prepared to trust us with the care of your people, even after we've let you down so many times, teach us to minister to one another's needs with compassion, sensitivity and discipline so that all are affirmed and encouraged. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We thank you, Father, for the wonder and the beauty of this world, for the order, the variety, simplicity, and the complexity of the universe. We thank you for all that humankind is able to do. May we use these gifts wisely and well for the good of all, including future generations yet to come. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. We thank you, Father, for forgiving us our sins and for the opportunity we have each day to learn the joy of forgiving each other. Help us to keep an active mind, forever learning, growing and finding out more about you and the world around us. Help us to be humble in the face of what we don't know and to bring everything to you in prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We thank you, Father, for all those who care for the sick, for the unstable, for the ungrateful and for the difficult. We pray for all those who are on the receiving end of hate and deceit, suspicion or abuse, and for those who cause um, pain to others of, or distress of any kind. We pray for your healing and transforming spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, Father, for those whose living and dying has taught us so much about love. Freed from their pain and restrictions of age or injury, may they enjoy uh, forever the life of heaven. Merciful Father, accept, accept these Christ prayers for the, the sake, sake of your Son, our, our Saviour, Saviour, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. 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 And we uh, sing now, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore.